Yeah. 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 Dream slash nightmare that began for me in 2004, and from which I have not yet quite awoken. So, uh, <coughs> I, in 2004, a, a business analyst that had known me from a previous life got in touch with me and said, "Would you like to come along and visit us at the at, at the Independent Transport Safety and Reliability Regulator, which was a typically bureaucratic uh, New South Wales government department?" Uh, and it's all about uh, transport safety regulation. And uh, they said, uh, she, she said, it's a greenfield project, it's a new start, it's an ed enterprise level app. Uh, would you like to come and tell us how, how you would do this? Uh, the good news is there's a budget of a million dollars, that's about half a million pounds, uh, and there's a year, 12 months available to do the project. Um, the bad news is 11 months has already been used up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a bunch of data analysts have come and done an exhaustive uh, data analysis project. They've left us with an ER diagram and cleared off with a million dollars. So, um, <laughs> it kind of got scarier and scarier as it, as it went along. They said, look, there's a little bit of money left, uh, a little bit of time left. How would you do it? And what's more, by the way, that there's members of the board that are convinced that this is a project that would take no less than $25 million uh, to build because that's what happens in these it was a really fascinating situation to be in. So I said, what do you do in these situations? I, I said, yes, <laughs> I'll do it. So they said, all right, how would you do it? Would you do it in Java or in .NET? And uh, I was really enjoying Curl Code at the time. Uh, but by 2004, um, I was already doing web apps in Perl, but using CGI, the CGI library and that sort of thing. I really, really wanted to try and recommend, like, oh, you know, I'd love to do this in Perl. And, uh, so on, but I felt that Pearl, at that point, it, it didn't have the, the cred to, to, to present this uh, with credibility at sort of the management board level, say this is my recommendation. And I was fully expected to sort of come up with one of them. So I sort of decided, well, am I going to be professional and um, say, yeah, we'll do this in, in Java and all that sort of stuff, or will I be honest? And, you know, I'd I, I really love to have a go at this. Like, how am I going to even get this past? Um, now, at, it's incredible. At about the same time, I became aware of uh, Maker. And I don't know how much it had preceded this uh, little uh, consulting assignment. Uh, I think it had only just come out, but I had a good look at it. And uh, I was quite enthusiastic because I thought this actually, even though it's a very, very small uh, package, and those of you that have seen it, you know, could probably see it you know, with some merit as being, if you like, a granddaddy of today. I was actually really impressed by some of the things that are in it. Uh, uh, sorry, I, it, was, it showed how to use Class DBI. That was the ORM at the time. And um, I kind of like Class DBI and, and still do for reasons for which we, you know, there's no time now to go into. But uh, Class DBI and Class DBI Loader and Template Toolkit obviously for the screen uh, rendering. And this was very much in line with uh, the approach and techniques that I had used in previous lives using technologies that are long since been buried in years gone by. But the fundamental concepts of how you get a relational database system and just explode it into a web app, um, people are sort of doing that all the time with tools all the time, but I think the really important thing and the fascinating challenge is how do you do that in a way that will scale and in a way that will allow you to start customising and tweaking this uh, automatically generated stuff and really turn it into an enterprise app. Um, these are essentially the ideas behind it. I don't think there's time to talk about them uh, in great philosophical terms, but essentially, in that very, very small initial Maypole package, uh, relationships driving website navigation, stringify rules, the importance of stringify rules, writing a stringify for every object in your object model, and then using those stringifications in strategic places in the app that you're generating, um, how we choose our templates and how we override our templates. The story about how it all comes together, um, um, that was enough to make me 
propose, uh, I said, <laughs> went to the board and I said, right, well, there's this very mature, very well established, <laughs> very highly regarded uh, package called Maypole, and yes, we can do all this with something called Maypole. <laughs> I know, I remember it very well. It was, uh, I was only sticking my head out. I mean, it was only my career at state, so uh, we thought, let's go for it. So we recruited j just one other programmer, and we had some business analysts on the job. And it just all came together. In short, it came together very, very nicely. Uh, it, it was a great app, um, like hundreds of tables. And like every app I've ever seen, the database design was evolving and morphing as the app went along, you know, despite the Despite the million dollar uh, data model, um, you're always changing tables and adding columns and all that sort of stuff. So uh, that led to something which, uh, when I look back on it, I think it was an important principle that we, we held in that app and we maintained in a bunch of apps following that. This principle that I like to just try and achieve if you're in one of these database driven web application projects. A very nice concept that these days we like to call continuous delivery and so on. One of the things of continuous delivery is if somebody changes the database, they've added a table, they've added some columns, maybe they've changed some columns or whatever. Um, they ought to be able to do that. There may be DBAs separate to your project. There may be ETL people. There's all sorts of other stuff going on. You know, you don't own the world. You don't own that database world. But we're changing the database over there. It should be possible to just restart, in those days, Apache. Restart Apache, Nginx, whatever. And I expect the web app that we've generated, customised, tweaked, whatever, I expect it to up and run. Uh, barring, of course, any mentions of the column that just got dropped, obviously. <laughs> so I guess I don't expect that much of it. But uh, if we're talking about adding or morphing the database to a very high degree, that is your goal. And um, you can think of ways to achieve that. And my argument is that if you do get that right, then you can get a very, very small team using Perl libraries to, me, to build big uh, enterprise level web apps. So um, the project managers were swinging from the chandeliers. They loved it. They couldn't believe that we could build such a big project so quickly uh, with all the customizations and everything. Um, I've been asked to uh, a, a medical health case management department. Um, with uh, very grave subject matter. It's about people who, who get dust-related diseases in their lungs and uh, the case management issues to do with that. Dust Diseases Board, another government department. And basically they said that was a good party trick over at, uh, over at ITSA, can you do that again? Uh, so we went over there. <laughs> um, by now Catalyst had appeared on the scene and uh, you know, we've been watching that with great interest. So we rewrote the same concepts using Catalyst, kept template toolkit, that took it, um, a package called Catalyst Enzyme, which I think is long, long maintained, but it provided some very, very handy templates that I thought were very, very good. Um, put them all together at the DVB, and then they said, well, where's the database? It's SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server. These are things over which we sometimes have very little control. So uh, how are we going to do authentication? It's Microsoft Active Directory. So you've sort of you know, been brought into a big government department, and again, you can't change these things. Um, but this scary thing actually turned into a plus, because, um, you know, this is not so much about Perl anymore, but about some fantastic open source projects, free TDS at all, and uh, Samba, obviously. Uh, in uh, getting these into a project and linking these up with our Catalyst app, we were able to set up really sophisticated group level authorization schemes and single sign on with Internet Explorer. Uh, and we had it absolutely humming against, would you put it, Microsoft SQL Server, which turns out to actually be a pretty good relational database engine. It's actually not too bad at all, it's, it's very good. And uh, so I had all my little Unity tools operating directly against that, and, and really it was super fast. So great packages there. Um, and that was a very successful project. Um, <laughs> so the original project manager for Metsa, by then he was working in a big uh, um, project uh, at a very, very large crime enforcement organisation in New South Wales that I'm not allowed to mention. So um, I went there, it's called police. <laughs> um, and it was just like the same story again. This time the database was Infinix. 
By then, the pattern had emerged. You've got to rewrite the loader of your ORM. Uh, the reason being, um, we, uh, as we were just chatting a second ago, I strongly believe in getting these things as dynamic and seamless as possible. Um, there's performance improvements you need to do to the loader. Uh, every loader that anybody's ever written for every ORM starts by just uh, analyzing one table at a time. You can speed that up, especially as your database scales to hundreds of tables. Just do one query against the catalog, you know, get all the catalog information, like tables and columns, uh, and then review it one table at a time. I and mean, now you're working on a big Pearl hash instead of hundreds of database queries, for example. Okay, so we, we morphed and hacked at this code. It was evil and it was very non CPAN culture, I must confess. Um, but we but we certainly, once again, put, this was in the data warehouse uh, with the police, we put together some big, really big apps uh, that again, you know, it used all the authentication and authorization and stuff by reading Active Directory, um, which was very successful. So over the years, these are projects that all used what me and my colleagues in, in Sydney just all, we just started calling it the Tables Framework, uh, for want of a better name. Um, a variety of uh, databases um, moved out of government departments and interface. I moved into finance apps, uh, real time finance, uh, customer management, school zone safety was back in a government app, and it was actually real time device management. But the database behind it, it was the same story all again. So the message here is an extraordinary variety of business application domains and a massively different look and feel across all of these applications, but at the core of them was this continuous integration principle um, of uh, just the tables framework, as we called it. Add there from a, a mate of mine who asked me if he could just pitch all the code and use it for his car club app, ourcarclub.info. If any of you are into motor cars and part members of car clubs, uh, that's a site using the tables framework written on Catalyst and MySQL, uh, which lets car club administrators um, uh, manage their clubs. It's a, it's, if you haven't played with it, it's, it's, again, the only message I want to come across is that these are complex apps written by very small teams. And I think that's what people might say when they say disruptive. Um, so, roll forward to this year, and my colleagues have always been on it and saying, well, when are you going to give something back to the world and put it all in CPAN? So I'm trying to do that now. Um, with the passing of time and looking at this stuff, uh, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a very strong advocate of Magalicious. That, that's my choice on which web framework to use. Um, so the templating becomes Magalicious template, which is another way of saying you get to do your templating as well. Um, and, and of course, it's, it's, it's uh, overwhelmingly the case that you go to DBX class now uh, because, of, um, and as we were mentioning a moment ago, some fantastic work these guys have done. I can see it all there on CPAN. Of, reverse engineering and managing every goddamn data management mechanism known to man, uh, they've done very well. So, okay, out of time. That's, that's about it. Tables Framework is now on CPAN. Uh, it's called Modulicious Plugin Tables. Um, there's a utility there that lets you put up a day one, or ground zero, uh, web app by just giving it a DBI stream. Um, but that's just a party trick. The, the real point is to be able to modify, enhance, and grow that app. Um, so this like, 0.1 release um, is sort of like a baby version of it yet, um, but I'm working on it. I'm using the site, a, a pretend site called optimalfutures.com. You can go to it now and you can look up the winners and losers on the London Stock Exchange yesterday uh, and do all sorts of queries against the London Stock Exchange, all using freely available data. So I'm using that site to research a whole bunch of other long fill stuff like AWS and Google Simple Sign and things like that. But I am using Modulus plugin tables, and uh, that's one week old now. Uh, the Ibix class schema later dynamic, where I'm starting to explore with uh, my, my take on as we, we were just chatting there about things that we might be able to do with um, the Ibix class schema later. Um, and um, yeah, thanks very much. That's that. We've got time for one quick question, if anyone has anything. Thank you.